Thank you, Pastor Dwayne. All right. Hey, um, we are in this brand new series starting this morning. For the next four weeks, we're going to be in it. But before we jump into the topic uh, of the day, let me just quickly give you a little bit of like an update. Uh, so last Sunday morning, we had 18 people get baptized, which was incredible. So we can give God praise for that. But also notable, we had our largest attendance here at MCC last Sunday morning, almost 1,400 people in house that day, and, um, and so, which is incredible. And so, um, so we're super excited about that, but I will say this, this service last week was pretty full. It was a pretty packed out. We were pulling out some chairs and trying to move people around. And so um, I just wanted to give you kind of that update because we're looking at how we're going to solve those problems. And so, um, so we know that like parking was definitely a, a big issue last week. Um, finding a seat in this second service especially was tough. And so, um, so let me just kind of give you a few things. We're going to be uh, looking at the way we seat people in the room. And so uh, we're going to begin to push people forward a little bit. And, uh, and so some of you guys right now, you're having a hard time with that. But last week we talked about like serving and all that. So I'm just going to ask you maybe to serve somebody that's going to be a guest because I don't want any guests to come in or not be able to find a seat. And so, um, so we're going to kind of look at some of those things. And I want to say this too. We're also talking about and kind of beginning to explore the idea of a third service. Uh, which is a pretty major switch for us. And so uh, we're just kind of praying into that and planning into that. And so, um, so that may be coming down the road not too far out. And so thank you for inviting people. If you can go to the nine o'clock service, feel free. That'd be awesome. Um, just take a little bit of pressure off this room. But both services are filling up, man, which has been incredible. And so um, over the last year, we've seen just God is moving and, um, and so last year, over 300 people came to Christ, 149 baptisms last year. I mean, just like, it's just been amazing. Our student ministry on Thursday nights, they've been having around almost 150 kids here on Thursday nights, which has been like unbelievable. And so we're just seeing God, kind of the, the overall water is just kind of rising across the board and God's moving. And so thank you for inviting people. Thank you for showing up. This is gonna be a year where God's gonna move in big ways. Amen? Amen. All right, praise God. So, uh, all right, so this series, Game Changers, it's not going to be a football series, but we are going to kind of use some football stuff, all right, and we're going to have some fun with it. Super Bowl Sunday is going to be a big day here, so be here on, on Super Bowl Sunday, which is in four weeks. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to have a great time. But this series, we're talking about kind of Game Changers, and so if you think about NFL football or just football in general, um, football's changed drastically over the last, you know, 100-plus years now, and so uh, down from the, the paddings and uh, the, uh, the way we do conferences and all these different things have changed over the years, uh, but I, I took some time this week and went through a bunch of lists and tried to figure out what are the top three, like, game changers in history, like the people that changed the game forever. And so I got, a, I got a, my list. It's, it's very subjective. It might not be your list, but I want to give you the three that I think stand out above the rest. Are you ready? Here we go. Number one, this guy right here. Anybody know who he is? Jim Brown. Jim Brown played in the late 50s and the 60s, uh, considered by many to be the greatest player that ever played the game of football. He was a running back. He had speed, but he also was kind of, he was a big guy. And so that was kind of a new thing in football. And so uh, he just, he dominated. I think his average was over five yards per carry through his whole career. I mean, just amazing, an absolute beast. He became the pattern for running backs that we see today with their size and speed. And so uh, Jim Brown, definitely a game changer uh, on my list. Number two, this guy right here, uh, Vince Lombardi. So Lombardi was the legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers. Uh, they won under his leadership. They won three straight, three consecutive NFL titles. Uh, they won five in a seven-year span, which is unbelievable. And uh, they actually won the first two official Super Bowls uh, back when they began having Super Bowls. And so, uh, and speaking of that, the trophy you get on Super Bowl Sunday is the Lombardi Trophy. And so this is absolutely a game changer. Never had a losing season as a coach. I mean, just crazy. Uh, and then number three, you probably know this one right here, of course. Um, <laughs> a, I mean, I don't think anybody can argue, right? I mean, it's like, I mean, I mean, who even knew Travis Kelsey before Taylor Swift came along? And so, I mean, just absolutely changing the game. Uh, it's a love story, baby. Just say yes. And so that's, that's just the way it is. I mean, 
some of you guys right now, you're like swallowing, like throw up. You just threw up in your mouth a little bit, like uh, it's right there. Uh, game changers. All right, so we're going to be in four weeks of game changers, and we're, we're talking about things in life, and we're going to look at Scripture, and we're going to look at the patterns we see in Scripture. What are four things that change the game for us as people of faith, people following Christ? What are four things that help us to do what Jesus said in John 10? He wants to give us life, and life to the full, abundant life. And these four things we're going to talk about, I believe, are keys, secrets, to walking in the fullness of life that I believe God wants every person in this room. If you are a follower of Christ, this message in the next four weeks, this is for you. God wants you to live in abundance. Amen? Not like just that you have a full bank account or a big house and all those things. No, but much, much more important than that, that you have abundant peace and joy. And that your relationships and your family are good. And that your marriage is solid. All these things. And so we're going to look at four things that I believe for us change the game. And so uh, question, what does winning, what does victory in this life, what does it look like? What does it look like to, to really be winning at life and, and for us in Christ to be winning in faith? Uh, more than any other place in the Bible, I think it was like kind of think about what, what does it look like for us to win, you know? I think about the book of Acts. And we're going to be in Acts for these next four weeks. We're going to look at the early church, and, and we're going to look at people like Peter and, and John and James and Paul and, and Timothy, all these guys that were kind of they were coming up in the early church, and they were, they were establishing the work of Christ on the earth. And so we're going to see in a generation, we're going to see the world shift with this new message, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, so we're going to look at the f four things that they did well that I believe for us, we've got to do well as well if we're going to win at life and be the kind of people that God's called us to be. And so what did they do that we should also be looking at? So if you're going to get a Bible today, open up to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. As you turn it, let me give you a quick kind of recap of what's been happening before the passage we're going to read. So, um, so Jesus, of course, goes to the cross, and then uh, he goes to the grave, and then the third day he rises up, and so he, he resurrects. At that point, he'll spend 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension when he goes back to heaven. So 40 days he'll spend with these disciples, followers. Actually, hundreds of people are going to see him risen. It's going to become really the, the foundation of the Christian faith going forward. It's going to be all these people that saw him alive and well after seeing him crucified on a Roman cross. And so, so he's going to spend time with all these people. He's going to eat meals. He's going to sit beside them. It's going to be around the campfire. He's going to teach all these things 40 days. And then on the 40th day, he's going to go to heaven. He's going to ascend in their sight into the clouds. At that point, before he does that, he said, hey, just so you know, before you do anything else, before you leave Jerusalem, make sure you stay here and wait until you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that I've been talking about, he says. So they go back, when he ascends, they go back to what we call the upper room, right? A second story room. And they're going to spend 10 days in that room. They're going to pray. They're going to seek God. They're going to, they're going to appoint Matthias to take Judah's spot uh, and the, uh, the, the 12 apostles there. So they're going to do some things, some business, but also they're going to spend time in the presence of God, spending time together, eating with one another, 10 days in that room. And then on the 10th day, 50 days past the resurrection, all of a sudden, they're going to begin to hear something in the room. They're going to hear what they describe as, as a violent wind that comes in. And the room begins to shake. And then all of a sudden, they're going to see fire in the room. And it's going to split up. And it's going to divide over them and over each person. In fact, let me just go ahead and read this. In chapter 2, verse 1, we'll start there. This is what it says. Check this out. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them, how many? All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so at this point, Peter and the rest are going to leave this room and they're going to head out onto the streets of Jerusalem. And they're going to be all speaking in other tongues. 
other languages. In fact, people in the, in the city are going to begin to hear in their own languages the good news of Jesus Christ. It's going to be this supernatural moment. But from the outside looking in, people are going to be like, what is going on? And people begin to point fingers and say, these people are like drunk. It's nine in the morning. This is ridiculous. You're all wasted, drunk at nine in the morning. And Peter stands up with a loud voice and he says, these people are not drunk as you suppose. And then he says, referring back to the prophet Joel in the Old Testament, he says, this is what Joel talked about in Joel chapter two. He says, this is what Joel talked about, the outpouring of God's spirit on all flesh. That old and young women and men are being filled with the spirit and they're gonna dream dreams and, and see visions. They're gonna do all these things. He says, this is that which the prophet Joel talked about. And then he begins to go on and say, this is a sign to you. So basically that you understand that Jesus was your Messiah. And he begins to preach the good news of Jesus to them. And it said, when he says that Jesus was Lord and Messiah, it says the crowd was cut to the heart. And they said, what can we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus, every one of you, for the remission of sin. And then he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise that God has given us. It's a promise for you and for your kids and generations for all those who God will call. And the people do exactly what Peter says. In fact, let's go to 41, same chapter. It says, those who accepted his message and were baptized, about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So 3,000 people put their faith in Jesus that day and are baptized in water. And then it goes on, verse 42, and this is where we're gonna hang today, right here, verse 42. Listen to this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Let's pray. Father, we pray that right now you would speak to our hearts, God. I pray that more than just like studying words on a page, that you would make your word do what it does. It would be living and active in our lives today. That God, you would speak to each person in this room that what you want to say and what you want us to, to take hold of from this message, God, would you help every person in the room to have ears that hear what the Spirit of God is saying to their life specifically. God, we give you this time and we thank you, Lord. We humbly come before you. We thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here together and to, to submit ourselves under the Word of God. Let it speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to read that verse. We just read the verse 42 and a different, this is the ERV version. Check this out. Listen to what it says. The believers spent their time listening to the teaching of the apostles. They shared everything with each other. They ate together and they prayed together. I want you to think about all four of those things, the listening to the teaching of the apostles, uh, spending time uh, sharing everything with each other, eating together, praying together. What do all those things have in common? They're all done in the context of together, of being together. Our first game change that we're going to see in the book of Acts is this. Game changer number one is doing life together. Doing life together. Now I want to say this, like as a church, we put a lot of priority on this right here. We want this to be a place where people feel known and where they know people, where they feel like they're part of a family. That is our intention, that we want to do life together. That people that come in this place, they will connect with other believers and you will do life in the context of a healthy, Christian, faith-filled, prayer-filled kind of community. Amen? That's what we're after. Here's why. It's biblical. This is biblical Christianity, is to do life in community, to do life together. But also, man, it is necessary for you. It is necessary for me to have a place that is family best. Necessary for your family, necessary for your health, necessary for your mental health, all those things. The book of Proverbs 27 says that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens a brother. You need brothers and sisters who are going to sharpen you who are going to keep you strong in your faith, who are going to pray and encourage you as you go forward in Christ. This year, you need 
the family of God around you. Okay, so I don't know what you come from. I don't know what your background is. I don't know what kind of dysfunctional church you might have grown in, right? Anybody have that church growing up? Yeah, okay. Maybe it was here, <laughs> it's possible. Um, hopefully not. But we wanna be a church though that we do this thing right. It's so important. So I wanna give you today three questions. If you go to a doctor, uh, you know, your doctor will often ask you diagnostic questions, right? They're gonna say, okay, so where does it hurt? How bad does it hurt? It's between one it's a, it's a frowny face and a smiley face, whatever that is, right? Here's your scale. And so they kind of begin to, is it, does it hurt here? Is it a dull pain or is it a sharp pain? How long has it been happening? They ask question after question after question because they want to diagnose thoroughly and rightly what's going on. So I'm gonna give you three questions today to help you kind of diagnose uh, your, your level of health when it comes to your community and your friendships in the body of Christ. Are you ready? You ready? All right, if you're taking notes, question number one. Am I lonely and is God okay with that? Am I lonely and is God okay with that? You know, admitting that you're lonely is one of the hardest things, right? A lot of people are lonely. But saying it out loud that I'm lonely, it's like it's a, there's kind of a stigma, almost like a shame that you can feel to make that statement because it, it's like I'm, there's something wrong with me if I don't have friends. But we're living in a society that more than any other time in history is very detached, very isolated. Many of you, like me, you didn't grow up in this area. You didn't grow up in this church. And so you're having to try to figure out how do I do friendships and relationships and how do I develop a community because all these people have their own kind of built-in community and they've all been friends since they were in high school and, and you're trying to figure out how do I break into this thing and have some good friendships. And it can be incredibly difficult. This, at this point in history, more than any other time, people are feeling the sting of being alone. And so you're, if, you're, if you feel lonely, you're not alone in your loneliness not alone in feeling alone. In fact, in recent years, our culture has shifted so much uh, with several factors that are making it so difficult to have a good, healthy community. You know, it used to be that, um, that you, we had a culture built around family and friendships and community and all these things, but now our culture is so much bending toward what is the most convenient, right? What is the most comfortable? How can I have my independence and privacy? This is how our culture is being wired. And so instead of going to like a restaurant to eat, now you're like ordering off of some app and they're bringing it to you. Like Uber Eats is coming to your door and they're dropping it off. So you don't have to even see anybody. You're like putting in the notes, drop it off on the steps. I don't want to see or talk to anybody. You know what I'm saying? And that's never been a thing before. And so because our, our culture is shifting in the way where we have garages now that have door openers, that we hit a button and it opens up and we go inside, we don't have to see our neighbors. I don't want to see them. I'm going to close the blinds. And this is how we're living our life in complete isolation. So because of that, they have this new term that's come out in the last couple of years called a friendship recession. People do not have friends. And loneliness right now in our culture is at an all-time high. And here's the deal, man. It's not good for you. In fact, physically in your body, they say that being lonely is like smoking 15 cigarettes a day. If you're lonely in life, if you don't have good friendships, I'm telling you, it's not good for you. It's bad for you. And so when we say, am I lonely? And the second part is important. Is God okay with that? He's not. Because everything about what God has for you is about your life flourishing. He wants your life in every way to flourish and be blessed. And you won't have that kind of flourishing if you're a lonely person. Check out this graph right here. So this graph is the average time daily that people spend with friends from 2003 to 21. That's the most recent I could get good data on. So you can see right here the trends, how everything is trending toward isolation. Everything is trending. So at one point, the average adult person in America spent 6.5 hours. This is, this is not, this is 2010, sorry. 2010, the average adult spent 6.5 hours, six and a half hours with friends every week. Right now, 
The stats are this. We spend two hours a week with friends. 59% in 14 years difference, drop. That's remarkable. The shift is so sudden and so like just fast that people right now, we don't understand all this is doing to us, but it's doing something. Yeah. That line in the middle, you see that's 2012 right there. That line uh, is kind of a demarcation because in 2012, smart, smartphones reached more than half of our population. So more than 50% in 2012 had a smartphone in their pocket. And so we're seeing that people are turning toward isolation, turning towards screens instead of people. And so, uh, so right now, 15% of young men today say they do not have one close friend. 15%. When I grew up in the 90s, it was 3%. That's a five times increase of young men that do not have one friend in their life. In the 90s, 45% of, of men said they, had, they would turn to a close friend. They knew that friend if they were in trouble. Today, 22% said they have a friend they could turn to. Many of you are young moms in the room, like you have young kids. Right now, one in five, less than one in five moms feel they have someone to turn to that will not judge them when they share their weaknesses and faults. Less than one out of five. Less than 20% of young moms have someone they can turn to and be honest with. That's crazy. For the first time in history in America, young people are more lonely than the sick and the elderly. For the first time in history. So I want you to consider what we're seeing. This is a massive shift. And so if you're lonely, you're not alone. Right now there are several hundred people in this room and there are several hundred people in this room that feel lonely. And this is why like doing a live together is a game changer. And I would say this, like the need is great and what we're seeing in the stats and all these things, it's scary, right? But also along with that, the opportunity for the church has never been greater. Because if we can just live biblical lives, to simply live according to the scriptures, we will get this right and we will become a beacon of hope for a culture that is lost in isolation and lonely every day and they need connection. The body of Christ, the church of the living God is the place that you will find that. You'll find it in this place. I believe that. For many of you today, maybe you're new to MCC and I'm telling you, you've been looking for a church. This is the place. You found it. Give us 60 to 80 weeks. Oh, it's <laughs> six to eight. I always mess that up. 60 to eight, whatever. God's going to move in your life and you're going to find people. You're going to find your people in this place. God's going to provide for you the right friendships, the right community, because God knows this is something you need. So are you lonely? And is God okay with it? No. He has something better for you. All right, that's question number one. Question number two, can I faithfully serve God without Christian friends? Can I faithfully serve God without Christian friends around me? I would say no, right? I don't, I don't think you can. And this is the reason why. It, it, it just contradicts the design. Like God, God made this thing to work in a certain kind of way and having Christian community and friendships around you is part of the design. It's like, if you, you know, it's like if you were designed to walk on your feet, but instead you crawled all the time, it would contradict the design of your body. God made you a certain kind of way. And so in the body of Christ, God made us to run together. He has great things in store for you, but I'm telling you, much of that is gonna be found in the context of living in community and having Christian friends. Remember the first thing that God said wasn't good in all of creation? Remember he created all the heavens and all the earth, right? When he created the, that separated the land from the water, he said, it's good. And when he put the lights and the, you know, the, the sun and the moon and the stars, he said, it's good. When he created mankind, he said, it is good. So every time it was like, good, 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 good. And then until finally he said, it's not good. And what was that? 
He said, it is not good for man to be alone. So he created a suitable helper in Eve. Listen, it's never good for us to be alone. Hebrews 10, 25 says this, check this out. It says, you should not stay away from the church meetings. Thanks for being here today, guys. You're all living according to this word. Here we go. As some are doing, we're not going to talk about them today, but like, <laughs> yeah, okay. But you should meet together and encourage each other and do this even more as you see the day coming. So the author of Hebrews here is saying, hey, like God did not make you to be independent. He made you to be interdependent. Like he made you to be connected to one another and even dependent on one another. Don't, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together because you need to have what the body supplies to you. And part of that he says is encouragement. You need to be strengthened and edified and encouraged. And when you come here on a, on a Sunday morning and, you're, and people are praying in the aisles, right? And you're like, you know what? I need to go get prayer today because I'm sick in my body or, I'm, or I'm, I'm done with bitterness or whatever it may be, or my marriage is on the rocks, whatever it is. Like you're, you're saying, I need this. I need the whole church to come alongside me. And this is how God meant us to be. It is not good for man to be alone. I don't think you can do this well without having a Christian community solidly around you. I heard a testimony this, this week, actually. Uh, Tara passed this on to me. And Michelle... She was here last service. I didn't point her out, but, uh, but she gave this testimony of her small group like uh, involvement and what it's meant to her over the last couple of years here at MCC. She says this. She says, in my small group, I was nurtured and encouraged by all of these amazing women. Never once did I feel left behind or like I was a burden because of my lack of knowledge. I was able to really grow and start deepening my relationship with God. In the winter of 2022, I signed up for a women's mentoring program where I was placed with Jen. It was through my work with Jen that I started to believe that I was someone who was worthy and loved and accepted by God. She said, then in September of that year, I made the decision to do a freedom group in the winter because I knew that it was time for me to go even deeper. Through freedom, I came face to face with so many strongholds in my life and the lies that I had believed about myself. The next year, in 23, I joined Rooted. Through a Rooted group, I realized why I desired to do kids ministry so much. It was because I never wanted a child to grow up feeling the way I did as a child lost and alone. I wanted them to know God's love and they would never be without it. Small groups for me have been an answered prayer and God's provision to a closer and better relationship with him. I love that in that testimony, you're seeing her own transformation, but you're also seeing that in the context of that community, she began to feel a calling and understood it. This is why I feel called to young people. Because your community around you is going to be the very people that are sharpening you, the very ones who are encouraging you, the very ones who are calling out of you, the calling and purposes of God in your life. You need people. This does not work on your own. It contradicts the design. God made us to do life together. Amen? Last question. So, how can I, if I'm lonely, how can I develop Christian friendships? Listen, good friendships are not like weeds. They don't just grow, right? I got weeds. I never, ever put fertilizer on them. I don't water them like on purpose. You know, they just grow. It just happens. But friendships are like a wood carving. You're like, you got to work at it. You're going to make this thing something, you know. You got to work at friendships. Put in the work. You got to take the risk. Last week we talked about it, right? This is going to be a year of greater risk, of courageous steps, bold steps that we're going to make in Christ. And so it's going to take some courage, some risk, if you're going to step into good, healthy friendships. Let me give you three practical kind of things you can do to help develop Christian community, Christian friendships here at MCC, okay? In your 60 to 80 weeks, you're going to be here over the next few years. All right. Number one. Stay in the room longer. Now, this is very practical. But many times we come on a Sunday morning and like amen happens and it's like, 
we're out. You know, getting our kids and heading out the door. Let me just encourage you. Like, spend a little more time in the room. Meet somebody around you. Say hi to some people. And then talk a little bit. More than just, hey, how's it going? Good. We're out of here. Say, hey, you know, where are you guys from? How long y'all been at MCC? Talk a little bit. Stay in the room. We were here on Friday night. And um, I was talking to Phil and Linda Farmer in the back over here after the worship night was over. And we had a powerful, powerful night. If you were here, man, it was incredible. So amazing what God did on Friday night. But we were here afterward, and I was talking to them, and there was a bunch of people in the room still. It's probably been 15, 20 minutes. And I mean, it's probably 100 people in the room still just talking and hanging out. And, uh, and Phil and the, both of them uh, turned to each other, and they said, this feels just like it did in the early days of MCC. And what they were saying was, it was like, in the early days, people just couldn't get enough of God or each other. They just wanted to be here and be a part of it. And so service would end, and they would just hang. They would just linger, you know? And it was like that. They were saying, man, this is like that was. It's it's such a life-giving environment that no one wants to leave. We're all just hanging out and enjoying being together. I want to encourage you, stay in the room a little longer. See what God will do and how God will connect you to people that are sitting right now down the road from you, all right? Number two, extend and accept invitations. Extend an invitation. I want you to think back to the life of Christ. Jesus made friends. You know that? He made friends. Like, he, he kind of figured it out. And how did he do it? He's walking down beside the Sea of Galilee one day. He sees some good friend material. There's Peter, James, and John, Andrew. And he says to them, hey, come hang out with me. I'll make you fishers of men. And they accepted the invitation, dropped their nets, and headed off. So over and over again, we see him extending an invitation to people to come and be with him, to come and be his friends. Now, I want to fast forward three years, because I want this is an important point to make. They got... Over three years, I got to see all these highlights, right? I mean, Peter, James, and John go to the Mount of Transfiguration, and they see Moses and Elijah and Jesus. I mean, it's like this, I mean, amazing moment, right? They see all these things. They're going to see Lazarus come out of the grave. They're going to see people get healed on the streets. They're going to see him teach thousands, multiply five loaves and two fish to feed thousands. I mean, it's just amazing, right? But at the end of his earthly life, Jesus will one night find himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to have his best friends there with him. He spent the last few hours with them in an upper room. So John 14, 15, 16, and 17, we're seeing him teach them. He he does the Last Supper, right? The, The new covenant. He's going to wash their feet in the upper room. But then he goes to a garden. I want you to picture the moment. It's dark. His His friends are there. But then he whispers to Peter, James, and John. He says, can you guys come with me a little farther? And he takes them into the garden. And he says to him, he says, guys, like the next few hours, like I'm, I'm like, I'm freaking out. I don't know how I'm going to do this. So my heart's like breaking inside of me. And the sorrow that I feel, the sadness I feel right now, I've never experienced anything like it. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Can you guys like just hang with me? Can you just like stay awake? I'm going to go pray, but I, I, I don't want to be alone in this. I want you to imagine it. He pulls them in deeper into the garden and he says, I don't want to be alone here. Please hang with me if through this. He gave him an invitation into his pain, another invitation. And and some of you guys, like inviting someone to your house for the game or out to lunch or to coffee, that part's easy, but inviting people into your pain, that part's hard. But I'm telling you, if we're gonna ever do community and life together, right, this has to be part of the equation. There has to be an openness and a vulnerability to say this is This is what I'm really dealing with. This is the real stuff. This is where my marriage is at right now. This is where my kids are at. This is the struggles we're having at home. This is what's happening at work, you know. You guys think I've been crushing it, but man, honestly, I feel like I might lose my job. Like, it's like, this is is the real me. I don't know how I'm gonna get through it. And can you please hang with me through this? If we're gonna do life together, 
there has to be the moments of brokenness as well as the moments of victory, right? The big ones and the low ones have to be part of it. So extend an invitation into the highs and the lows of your life. Number three, join a small group. Join a small group. Listen, this is like, it's a big-ish church, and we're a growing church. And here's the deal. You can learn in rows, but you do life in circles. You can learn here. This is good. We can learn. You're taking notes. You've got a Bible on your lap. Like it's, this is a great place to learn. But if you're going to do life, you have to do it in circles. And this is where life transformation happens. We always tell people, like, you got to make a big room small. You have to get a small room in a small group. And you can do this today in our foyer. You can do it right now when you leave service. You can head out and sign up for a small group. We're going to do four weeks in this series, Game Changer Small Groups. And so if you're not part of a group already, that's an easy four-week commitment. Just kind of jump in and see how it is. Maybe you'll make a lifelong friend in that group. And you, might, you have all kinds of excuses. I'm busy. I don't have a lot of evenings right now. My kids are in sports, whatever it may be. I'm just going to tell you, man, let's take a bold move. Let's be courageous. Take a risk. Get in a small group. It will transform your life. Y'all with me? You know, the, as, as I was kind of studying football stuff, I, I read the story about the first huddle in history in a football game. And uh, it happened actually back in the 1890s. It was a college uh, football game. And Gallaudet University, which is up in D.C., uh, actually, it's a, uh, it's a school. They had formed a football team about 10 years earlier. They had a new quarterback. His name was Paul Hubbard. And Paul was his quarterback. And, and, um, and at some point in a game they were playing, Paul said, everybody get back here. He called the whole team back. And they got into kind of a huddle. It wasn't like this yet. It was like a circle. And he just gave them the, gave them the, the next play. He said, okay, we're going to do this next play. And uh, got back out there and they ran the play. Now, the reason that Gallaudet needed this kind of thing, and the reason they it kind of spurred on this, was because this is a university for the deaf and hearing impaired. And so at the line, most quarterbacks would be yelling out like coded messages and the team was responding to these codes, right? And they would run a play. But if you're deaf or hard of hearing, the only way to get through the message is to use sign language. And so what was happening is teams were having uh, students that knew some sign language and they were saying, they're going long, they're gonna do a running play. And they were giving the cues that, that Hubbard was trying to give. So he called them all back and he gave them the next play in a tight circle. Now, the reason they did this was because they had a known weakness. They understood that we, we can't hear like other teams. We have to do something different because we have a weakness in this area. And this became a thing, of course, and teams have been using it for over 100 years now. As Christians, as followers of Christ, you have weaknesses. You have also opposition. They're playing against guys that wanted to take their heads off. So the only way to get the message out was to come into a circle and tighten up and say, this is what we're going to run. I'm telling you, as followers of Christ, if you're going to run the play right, you have to come into a circle. And people in your life need to be able to speak into your life and, and, and kind of walk alongside you as you walk through trials, as you face opposition. There are things that you will have in community you cannot have otherwise. James 5 says that confess your sins one to another another that you may be healed. He doesn't say bring that sin to God, that you may be healed. You can be forgiven there, but the healing comes in the context of a circle. And so I'm telling you, there are some things you can never have in Christ unless you have them through Christ people. You got to be in community. You have to do life together if you're going to do this thing right. Some things only happen in a circle. Now, I said last week that our theme for the year is going to be stand in the name, right? That's going to be our theme for this year. And we're going to do a few things that are a little bit different because of this. But each Sunday morning, our plan is to, to bring the, 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 uh, the topic into one of the names of God 
And then we're gonna stand, literally, in that name. There's a passage in Psalm 68, verse six, check this out. It says, God places lonely people in families. Many of you, God brought you to MCC because you needed a family. I could have probably 100 people walk up here and talk about how when they came to MCC, they found their family. Because God places lonely people in families. Now, one thing I think is really cool about that is the word God in that text is the name that God uses in Scripture often, which is Elohim. In fact, in the beginning of your Bible, if you go to the very first verse in your Bible, it will say, in the beginning, Elohim, God, created the heavens and the earth. Now, what's cool about that name specifically, it's unique, because the word Elohim in the Hebrew is a plural word. It could be translated God's with an S. But we know from the scripture that God is one. He's not multiple. We don't, we're not polytheistic. We serve one God. So when he says in Genesis, when he says, let us make man in our image using plural pronouns. What's he saying? Is he saying, let me and all the angels make man in our image? No, because the Bible says that we're, we were made in God's image a little lower than the angels. That's what it says. So he was saying, let us, as in Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, this communal God, that is one God, but in three persons, this supernatural thing that God is and always has been. He is one God, but he was saying, I'm Elohim. I'm represented in multiple people. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so God has always existed in community. He's never been alone. He's one, but he's never been alone alone. So when you and I were made in the image of God, we were made with this internal hardwiring for community, for not doing life by ourselves. God does not want you to be alone. So we're going to stand in this name, Elohim. And if you're here today and you would say, man, I feel like at times at least, I feel lonely. Or maybe you're just saying this year, I want to develop good friendships in the church, a Christian community around me. Maybe you have some friends, but it's been hard to make Christian friends, you know? So whether you're saying I'm lonely or whether you're saying I just want, I just want more and better in this area of my life, we're gonna stand in a moment in the name Elohim, and I'm gonna pray for you. And I'm gonna tell you right now, so 65% of lead pastors say they're lonely. And I'm just gonna be honest with you. This has been tough for me at this stage of my life. I don't know why, but it is. So if I'm honest, I'll stand first and say, because I'm praying that God will give me just some good guy friends that I can just do life with. It's something I feel like, I, this is something I need more of and better, all right? And so I'm gonna stand first. If you wanna join me and stand in this name, Elohim, I'm gonna ask you to stand right now. Go ahead. I want you to look around because it's easy in a room like this to think I'm the only one. I'm the only one that feels alone. Everyone's got friends. Look around. You're not alone in feeling alone. But thank God we're standing in the name of the one who created community and he's gonna bring it to your life. Amen? Let's pray together. Everyone stand up. If you're not already standing up, which I think almost everybody is, but everybody get up. All right. God, we thank you so much this morning that you are Elohim, that you are the God who is, has always existed as one God, but in three persons. And Lord, today you've wired us for community. And I believe that you're saying that if we'll take some bold steps, you will bring into our lives good, godly friends. So I pray for every person here, God, that you would supply what is lacking. That God, each of us would would finish this year out with closer and deeper friends in the body of Christ than we've ever had. I pray this would be a year of sharpening, a year of, uh, of just loving one another, 
a year of pressing into this topic, Lord, and seeing you do miracles for us in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Stay standing where you're at. I have one more question for you today. If you're here this morning, and uh, if you've never met Jesus Christ, I want to introduce you to him, okay? Here's the deal. My wife is my absolute best friend on the planet, right? But when I was 15 years old, I met the best friend anybody could ever have, and his name is Jesus. Absolutely. The Bible describes him as the, the kind of person, the kind of friend that will stick closer to you than our brother will stick close to you, Right? And so I've seen God walk with me through the, the highs and lows of my journey, and there have been many of both, right? But I've seen Jesus be a friend that has stayed with me. He's never left me. He's never forsaken me. He is in my corner on my worst days. He's that kind of friend. And listen, some of you guys today, you feel like, man, I, I got so much, like, so much sin, bad decisions, so many regrets, so many mistakes, and you might think to yourself, I'm kind of beyond the mercy of God. I don't think he would even accept me. Let me tell you this. They said of Jesus, this was kind of one of his titles was this. I love this. It said, Jesus is the friend of sinners. So if you're a sinner and you're like, man, I'm, I'm too much of a sinner. Let me tell you, if you're a sinner, Jesus is your friend. He loves you right where you're at. You don't have to clean up and become a non-sinner before you come. Come to him just as you are. He'll clean you up. He'll change your life. He'll transform you from the inside out. But he does that work. Amen? Amen. So come to your friend. He's the best friend anybody could ever have. If you're here this morning and you want to put your faith in Christ and begin to live for him and with him, and you want to have him be your friend like he was mine at 15 years old and still is today. If that's you and you're like, I want to make that decision this morning, I'm just going to ask you to boldly raise your hand real fast. We're going to pray together. Just put it up real high. I'll say, yeah, and you can put it back down. Real quick, thank you. Anybody else? Real quick, thank you. Yeah, praise God. Somebody over here, I missed you. Raise it up again real high right there. Thanks, buddy. Praise God. Anybody else? Man, I, I like this. I like bold people, man. They're like, yeah, that's me. I love that. I think God loves that too. Amen. Anybody else real quick? All right, we're going to pray. Everyone say, Jesus, please come into my life. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for always loving me, even on my worst days. And now I ask you to forgive my sin to purify my heart, to come inside of me and be my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, that my friendship with you is going to last for all of eternity. You're never going to leave me. You're never going to turn your back. You're with me all the way. And I'm with you all the way too. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen. Praise God.